How many of you guys are ready to grow? How many of you are genuinely ready to grow? You're, you're not satisfied with where you are spiritually. And I don't care how mature you are spiritually, we all should be desiring to grow even more every single day. Every one of us. Every one of us. And you're in a place to grow today. You're, you're in a place not just geographically, but you're, you're in a season of growth where we have to grow. The church can no longer remain where the church is. And I believe that God is calling us at this house to get with it. God is calling us, and don't let this offend you, but I believe God is calling us as a house to grow up. Three amens on that right there. <laughs> I offended somebody. Let me do it again. I believe that God is calling us as a church to grow up. See, Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul was saying, I made progression. He was progressing in life. We need to be, we need to be able to progress spiritually every single day. I want to go back to last week, if we can get that up on the, our, our PowerPoint from last week, and just do a little bit of, of a recap, and then go into today's, into today's Word. Let's go up on the mountain. Jesus, Peter, James, and John were up on the mountain. The transfiguration took place. The Bible says, as they descended the mountain, somebody say descended the mountain. As they came to the base, the Bible says that they saw a crowd at the bottom of the mountain. Now, only three disciples were with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. So the other nine were at the bottom. And the Bible says there was a crowd of people that were there. And there were some scribes. Scribes were some self-righteous, ungodly people that did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. So these scribes were arguing with the disciples. Jesus gets there and asks the question, what are you arguing about? What's, what's this noise about? So one of the men that was in the crowd, he steps up and says, well, Lord, I, my son, he, he's been having seizures from, from, from birth, and, and he's, 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 just, he's in bad shape. He's deaf. He's dumb. He can't speak. He's devil-possessed, in other words. He's, he's possessed with the devil. And, and he said, I, I brought my son to your, your, your disciples, but they were unable to heal him. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't do it. Let's go to verse number nine. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit. That won't, let him, that won't let him talk. And wherever his, the Spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground, then foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes extremely exhausted. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Next verse. Jesus said unto them, and I believe when Jesus said this, if you, if you read this right here, I believe Jesus said this with frustration. Let me read it. And Jesus said to them, I don't think he said it this way, oh, faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. No, I don't believe Jesus said it. Jesus probably said it something like this. Oh, faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring this boy to me. I believe Jesus probably said it along those lines as opposed to the first one. How about you? How many of you know Jesus got a little bit irritated from time to time? Do you think if Jesus was, was walking the earth today, do you think he'd get a little irritated with you? A little frustrated with you? Do you think he'd get a little bit of frustrated with me? Oh, y'all don't have to be scared. I'm, I'm human just like y'all are. Absolutely, he would. And I believe in this moment, Jesus was a little bit irritated and a little bit frustrated. How long shall I have to put up with this? In essence, what Jesus was saying to his disciples and what I believe God is saying to us, his church, is you should be farther along than this. That's what Jesus was saying in essence that day. He had given them the power to heal, right? That they saw him perform miracle after miracle. Matthew chapter 10, first verse, the Bible says that he called them unto him and gave them power to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease and to heal and, and to cast out demons. Don't you know we've got that same power? We, we possess that same authority. 
you should be farther along than this. I don't want to spend much time on this part, right? We're going to skip on. Why is the church no farther along than what it is? Logical question, right? Why is the church, the global church, the body of Christ, no farther along than what it is? Number one, I believe that we've grown up in and have created a culture of people that go to church and do church instead of being the church. Now, see, some people may not like that statement, but Jesus said you should know the truth and the truth should make you free. See, I, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I didn't like to take, to take baths. Anybody, any boys didn't like to take, don't raise y'all's hand, but any boys didn't like to take baths when you were little. I know all the girls, y'all, y'all love taking baths, but I did not like to take a bath. I don't know why. Just, most boys don't for whatever reason. I didn't like to take baths. And I've got a brother, older brother. He was so slick when, when, when it was time to take a bath, he'd run the bath water, go in there and start splashing the water with his hand <laughs> to make our mama think he was taking a bath. So, so really, we weren't being clean. Well, he wasn't. He definitely wasn't. At least I was taking a bath. I was made to take a bath. What am I trying to say? See, my mama knew best. She knew that that was unhealthy for us not to take a bath. And after a while, you're going to stink when you don't take a bath, right? Or a shower, whatever you do. Y'all better not be laughing. <laughs> Same goes to y'all. But I believe the reason why the church is in the shape that it's in today and the reason why our city is in the shape that it's in today is because the church hasn't been the church. See, we know how to, we know the right things to say, the right things to do. We go to church, it, it becomes accustomed to us if we're not careful. And, and we come in here on a weekly basis. When I say here, I'm talking about the church, period. But we go to church on a weekly basis. We go praise and worship, praise God. It was good preaching, praise God. Then we go back out. What are we doing? Are we really being the church? Are we really being the church or are we doing church? See, there's a big difference between doing church and being the church. Can I get a witness? Amen. Now, today's probably not going to make you shout. That's okay, though long as it makes us change. See, because Jesus said, you guys should be farther along than what you are. God is saying to his body, you should be farther along than what you are. What is the church? A vessel in which the Spirit of God dwells. Number two, a vessel in which the Spirit of God reveals his love. Number three, a vessel in which the Spirit of God uses to draw the lost and hurting to himself. Number four, a vessel in which the power of God flows. How do we get beyond simply going to church and going uh, and doing church to genuinely to genuinely become the church? I told you last week that starting today, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do that. We, we, we've got to get beyond going to church. Going to church is good. Don't get me wrong. You need to go to church. We need to go to church, don't we? we, we, we need, it's better to go to church than to stay at the house. We, we need, see, some people get saved at church when they didn't, even want, didn't plan on getting saved. But they went to church, and the Spirit of God got a hold of them. Jesse Johnson, I don't think he's here today, but Jesse went to church, and, and, and he wasn't really in the church, but his wife did, went to a revival, and then she took this handkerchief from that revival, took it back home, and put it under his pillow, under his mattress, or something like that. And something supernatural began to happen with Jesse. Now he's in love with Jesus. Now he's in love with Jesus. But, but my question is, how do we get past going to church and doing the church or doing church to becoming the church? Now, here we are today. And I'm going to start today my title. I'm going to start it out in a question form. Here's my question. Are you a sellout? See, when, when I was in school, if somebody called you a sellout, that was fighting words. Sell out was a very derogatory term. It, it was a very degrading term. It was calling you weak. It was calling you a wimp. Somebody call you a sellout, buddy. It's time to knuckle up, go to toe to toe. If you know what toe to toe means, it means time, it's time to box. It's time to go round and round. But I want to ask you a question today. Are you a sellout? Turn to your neighbor and say, are you a sellout? <laughs> don't y'all fight. It's just a question now. <laughs> it's just a question. Y'all don't y'all start fighting up in here. I have to lay some hands on some folks. <laughs> Are you 
a sellout. But I want to define what a sellout is from two different perspectives, the world's view of a sellout and a biblical view of a sellout. Let's look at the world, what the world has to say first. Here's a world view. World's definition of a sellout is a person who compromises their integrity, morality, authenticity, or principle in exchange for personal gain. That's the world's perspective of a sellout. Well, what does God see as a sellout, a biblical definition of a sellout? A person that not only gives Jesus their heart, listen to this, but also their time. Did you know you can give Jesus your heart and not give Jesus your time? A person that not only gives Jesus their heart, but also their time, dedication, and commitment, also known as their very life. See, Jesus might have your heart today. Your, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life, and when you die, you're going to go to heaven. He may have your heart, but does he have your life? Big difference. He might have your heart, and you're going to go to heaven, but does he have your life? Are you a sellout for Jesus? Are you sold out for the cause of Christ? There's a story in the Bible where this man went to Jesus with an issue. How many of you guys have had some issues in your life before? Who's the best person to go to when you got issues? Besides your pastor, besides your wife, besides you, your husband, besides your kids, the best person to go to is King Jesus, right? He, he's a problem solver, right? Matthew chapter 19, starting with verse number 16. We're, we're going to read this story where a guy had an issue, went to the problem solver, and he walked away differently than I expected, than I would have expected. Matthew chapter 19, starting with verse number 16. When you're there, say amen. If you need a few seconds, say hold up. All right, I'm going to hold up. Matthew 19, verse number 16. And behold, there came and said unto him, I'm sorry, and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these, I can just pitch him with his little arrogant self, little cocky self, as my mom would say, his little mannish self. All these things have I kept from my youth up. Uh, Lord, what, what do I have missing? What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou will be perfect or mature, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had a lot of stuff. He had great possessions. He had a whole lot of stuff he wasn't, wasn't willing to part from. Nothing wrong with having a lot of good stuff. How many of you guys like nice things? Nothing wrong with having nice things so long as your nice things don't become your God. So that your nice things don't become ahead of God. Here's a question for you. Are you spiritually sold out for Jesus? Let's just pause for a few seconds. Are you spiritually sold out for Jesus? Going to church every Sunday don't make you sold out for Jesus. The devil walks up in church sometimes. But are you, are you spiritually sold out? for Pastor, I tithe faithfully every Sunday. Tithing every Sunday don't mean you sold out for Jesus. I know a guy that, that was faithful, a faithful tither, and wasn't even saved. He just didn't know it. You're looking at him. I was a faithful tither before I gave my heart to Jesus. 
Because I thought that because being a good person was all it took to become a Christian. Oh boy, was I wrong. And thank God I was exposed to the truth. Because me and my good self would have gone straight to hell had I died. Being a faithful tither doesn't make you sold out to Jesus. Now that right there should be an attribute of you being faithful to God. Are you being sold out to Jesus? Are you spiritually sold out for Jesus? If so, is it evident through your actions and lifestyle? Another question. This is not going to be on the screen, I don't think. Maybe it is. If you were in an earthly dating, yes, it is. If you were in an earthly dating relationship, please hear this. If you were in an earthly dating relationship with Jesus right now, would he be happy in that relationship? And, and I know we're all in a relationship with God right now, but I'm saying if Jesus was in the flesh, walking around, if he was your boyfriend, if he was your girlfriend, would he be happy in that relationship? Would the amount of time that you spend with him, combined with your level of dedication and commitment to his church, cause him to remain in that relationship? If Jesus was your boyfriend, if Jesus was your girlfriend, the time that you give him right now, would he be happy with that relationship? Your level of dedication, when I say you, I'm talking about me too. Our level of dedication and commitment to him, would he be satisfied or would he break up with you? Let me ask another question. Talking about relationship. If you were dating someone that gave you the amount of time that you're giving God, would you break up with them? Let the church say amen. I, I know I'm preaching good this morning. <laughs> this is some good stuff right here. This is some hard stuff, but this is some good stuff. See, let me tell you why this is some hard stuff, but some good stuff. Now, it's not hard because I'm beating you down, because God doesn't need me to beat anybody down with the Word. Matter of fact, God won't even beat you down with the Word. God will gently give you the Word of God, and it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict that heart when you ain't right. Can I get a witness this morning? But see, one thing we don't need is, oh, it'll be okay, baby. It's all right. Just, just do what you want when you want. No, that ain't how the kingdom works right there. That's why the church is in such a mess that it's in right now. This is some good stuff. I'm preaching to myself, and there's some good stuff right here. Let, let me tell you something that happened to me 20-some years ago. I was going through a a, a, a situation in my life where I was struggling spiritually. And I called this, this 1-800 number for prayer, hotline, whatever it was, for prayer. I needed a simple prayer. Somebody say simple prayer. Somebody say, don't preach to me. Just pray for me. So I called this, this, this 800 Christian prayer, prayer line for some prayer. The dude gets on the phone, and I tell him what my issue is, and he says, do you love God? Yes, sir. He said, the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Oh, boy. I'm thinking, you, you old devil, I didn't call to ask for this. <laughs> you supposed to save God, give him strength to help my brother. You ain't supposed to be preaching to me. I said, yes, I love God. He says, the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I said, I love him. I love him, love him, love him. We talk a little bit more. And I guess I was just kind of, I was wanting him to feel just a little sympathy for him. Anybody, want, anybody ever been wrong, but you wanted some sympathy? Yeah. Just me, okay, all right. <laughs> it's cool. He wasn't having it. So he quoted that scripture to me again. He says, do you love God? I said, yes. He said, the Bible says if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In other words, ain't no compromising coming here. We have to have the truth. Not a little dab, but we need the word of God spoken in love because my, my encouragement, praise God, we need encouragement. 
But the only thing that's going to turn us toward the heart of God is the truth, the Word of God. So, so when we get the Word of God and it, it steps on our toes a little bit, I didn't like that that day, but it changed my life. Otherwise, I would have still probably been going around that mountain another 20-some years. But it was in that moment when I was face-to-face with reality and the truth that I made a decision to, Shayla, get you behind together. Get yourself together. Church, get yourself together. You see that? Because it's not you, but it's us from the pulpit to the back door. See, it's time for us to grow up spiritually so that the church can truly be the church, so that we can truly be about the Father's business and not talk about being about the Father's business. Can, can I tell you a little something, something that, that God's got stirring up in my heart? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about us. I'm going to do a little bit later. I'm going to talk about us a little bit, us as pastors a little bit later in my message. If you were in an earthly relationship with Jesus right now, would you be happy in that relationship with the amount of time that you spend with him? Combined with your level of dedication and commitment to his church, cause him to remain in that relationship or would he break up with you? Here's the part about us, pastors. Although with good intentions, and this is probably, yeah, it is, man, somebody's pretty good back there. Although with good intentions, somebody said good intentions. Although with good intentions, gimmicks and and challenges from the pulpit don't work. There are only temporary attempts to get people to sell out to Jesus. Gimmicks and challenges don't work. They're temporary fixes. I wouldn't even call it a fix. Preacher, what do you mean explain yourself? Have you ever heard the pastor say, man, if we get 100 people to Bible study, I'll shave my head bald or whatever. This, this one pastor said if he could get a certain number of people to come to church for a certain amount of time, he would preach from the rooftop, and he did it. That next Sunday, it went back to the usual crowd. Why is that? Because it was just, and, and we have good intentions. I've used challenges before. I ain't got on nobody's roof, and I ain't shaving nobody's head for you to come to church. You know why? Because I can't make you sell out. I can't cause you to sell out. Just like you can't make me sell out. I had to sell out for myself. Gimmicks and challenges from the pulpit don't work. They are only temporary attempts, not fixes, attempts to get people to sell out to Jesus. Now, to our defense, we want people to sell out for Jesus. Because God has put the burden on our hearts. God has placed the vision in our hearts of what we can do in our city, in our nation, around the world of what the church should look like. But we are only the visionary. We can't make it happen by ourselves. It takes all of us grabbing hold of the vision and making it come to fruition. That's where we make it happen, not just me and not just you. Somebody said, Pastor, you're doing some good preaching this morning. I know y'all really don't mean it, but I just wanted to hear y'all say it. You mean it? I believe y'all do mean it. Am, Am I preaching in love? Absolutely. Am I speaking from my heart? Absolutely. Does it hurt sometimes? It probably does. But before you got it, guess who got it? I got it. I got it before you got it. Now, we're getting it together. Now, let's get it together and let's get it. How about that? See, let let me tell you why I've got such a burning desire in my heart because, see, I know where the church is supposed to be, but, but sometimes we just kind of drag along and, and, we, and we, we, we become so accustomed to the way things have been, but just because you're accustomed to it don't mean it's right, though. Just because it's the way Granny used to do it and Grandpa, that don't mean that it's right. It's time that we go to a new level because where there's new levels, there are new devils. Y'all get that? I'm going to challenge, I'm going to challenge pastors in our, in our community. Let's step up. We, what, what you mean by challenge the pastors in our community? See, the, the church has remained silent way too long. Yes, we see it. We, we, we see what's taking place, but we, we kind of want somebody else to go out and fix it. We, we want somebody else to handle that. 
or we, we want to pray it away. Prayer is good. Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, prayer is good. We've got to pray. But let me tell you something. Faith without works are dead. Faith without works are dead. When Jesus and his disciples were on the sea, or when Jesus was walking on the sea, and that storm, and Peter and the others saw Jesus and thought he was a ghost, Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me or allow me to come walking to you on the water. Jesus said, come. One rhema word. Now, Peter had to go, right? He believed that was Jesus, but nothing happened until he got off out of the boat and began to walk. Break it down a little bit farther, preacher. Please do that for me. It's great that we come in here on Sunday mornings and, 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 and worship God together and be ministered to and minister to one another. But what do we do when we leave out of here? What do we do on Sundays? I mean, what do we do on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays? Oh, what Wednesday you here? Thursday and Friday and Saturday. What do we do? What, what do we do when controversial situations take place and nobody wants to get their hands messy? Kind of like yesterday on, on Garrison Avenue. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it. Kind of like yesterday on Garrison Avenue where there's these people, uh, the, these um, um, Klansmen, whatever they are, hate groups, had this banner. And, and I don't know if they were from Fort Smith or somewhere else and came in. It really doesn't matter. But they set up camp in our city. This banner that said, diversity equals white genocide. Diversity equals white genocide. So you mean to tell me that God messed up when he made black people? You mean to tell me that God messed up when he made Asian people and Hispanic people and Indian people? You mean to tell me that God messed up when black people dated white people and outside of their race? Now, I don't know how you feel about dating outside of your race. If you don't like it, that's between you and God. But don't you dare look at somebody else who chose to date outside of their race because they were attracted to that person. Don't you dare think that your race is any better than any other race because there's only one race that God created, and that is the human race. But see, nobody wants to say anything about that, the church I'm talking about. It's not the city's job to, to address that. The city has their place. It's not the city's job. It's not the police officer's job. They, they've got their place. They'll come along the side. It's not their responsibility. Preacher, you off target now? Nope, you better check your word of God. That's a demonic spirit. And you don't go to a, to a spiritual battle with natural weapons. Let the church say amen. amen. It's all right. Don't, don't y'all be offended. It's okay. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. It's just the Word of God. It's in my heart, okay? We're going to worship the God of the Bible, not the Bible. Can the church say amen on that right there? Go, go, go back to Garrison Avenue. Go back to Garrison Avenue. See, see this right here, God began to speak to my heart about two or three years ago about stuff that, that to Shayla, and it was out of ignorance. I just didn't know. I didn't know any better. When you, when you know better, you need to do better, right? Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, you got to do better, right? God began to speak to my heart about a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. I, I need to get more involved in, this, in, in what's going on in my community. How can you make a difference and you don't even know what's going on? So it was at that point that I decided that, that different things that, that take place in our community, I'm going to be a part of that. So yesterday I called a buddy of mine or a few buddies and uh, went down to, 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 to Garrison. Trust me, I wasn't going to walk up and snatch nobody's sign. I wasn't going to do no crazy stuff like that. I was going to have a couple of officers go with me. And, and anyhow, so I get there and the sign was gone. Sign was gone. It was replaced with a sign of diversity and all that good stuff. Praise God. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Where is the church at? Not talking about y'all. Where was the church at? 
a few weeks ago, and it's not just race, a few weeks ago where this, this guy wears a Klansman Costume is not good enough word for him. Mess. He wears this mess into this bar here in Fort Smith, right here in Fort Smith, and he wins the best costume contest. Where was the church at? Where, where was the church at? And, and, and don't get me wrong, it's not just a race thing. There's other issues that we've got to get involved in. The church has to lead. So, somebody, somebody, this, this one guy, after I post, I made a post yesterday about this situation uh, on Garrison. And I realized that doing that, I'll become a target for negativity. But the fact of the matter is, I really don't care. Because not everybody's going to like what you do. But I do believe that as a man of God, we need to call a spade a spade and not sit back and, 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 and ignore something that's wrong when you know that it's wrong. So I had this guy get on my, he gets on my post. Somebody say my post. He gets on my post and he says something along the lines of, I bet if this was a black hate group, you wouldn't have said a beep thing. You know what I said? Nothing. Deleted his butt. <laughs> he gets no play on my wall. I, 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 don't, I don't need any distractions. What he says is, rel- is irrelevant to me. I don't have to answer to him. His name ain't J-E-S-U-S. I don't owe him anything. Any, now, I do want to tell you, had it been the Black Panthers or whatever hate group it was, you best believe Tashayla would have done the same thing Hate is hate is hate is hate. I don't care how you fix it up. Wrong is wrong. My pastor friends, I'm going to challenge them this week. Now, I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but we need to do something. But there'll be a lot of them that, well, I I don't know, man. I don't want to get involved in that because that's a very controversial situation. Yeah, you're right. It is controversial. That's why you need to get involved in it. Would you let somebody come in your backyard and start ripping up stuff? Absolutely not. Would you let somebody walk in your house and start turning your furniture all upside down? Absolutely not. Well, man, this is why here's our, this is our property, right? This is our city, right? So why in the world would we let some demonic spirit to come set up camp in our city? Ain't going to happen. Church, it's time to get ready. It's time to be about the Father's business. Let's stop talking, church, and let's be the church. Let's stop talking, church. And be the church. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I've got you. I've got you back. Yeah, way back. I don't need you to have my back. I want you to be by my side. To my leaders, to my pastors right now. I'm not talking about you. I'm not, to my pastors. So what if, 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 if it's controversial? So what if, if it gets a little bit messy and people talk about, well, what, so-and-so, I heard so-and-so is getting involved in, yeah, so what? Don't you, if Jesus was here on the earth in Fort Smith, Arkansas, do you think Jesus was sitting at home eating turkey and dressing or whatever and not take care of business? Well, now, he might eat turkey and dressing first, but then go take care of business. <laughs> I'm serious. Do you think Jesus would have got involved in that? You better believe you would have. See, it's not about being controversial or messy. It's about standing up for what is right. That's why I say the church has to be the church. You can't come do church and not be church. But you can't even be the church without selling out first. You can't be the church without selling out first. You can't be the church without selling out first. When you sell out to Jesus, listen to this, and this is not going to be on the screen. When you sell out to Jesus, no one has to challenge you to come to church faithfully. Hear that? When you sell out to Jesus, nobody got to challenge you to come to church. Why do you do it? Because you sold out. 
Don't get me wrong. People take vacations. I get that. People get sick. I'm not asking you to, to come to church if you're sick. I'm not asking you that. But when you sold out and you're able, nobody has to ask you to come. When you sold out to Jesus, no one has to challenge you to be dedicated or committed to serving. Why do you do it? Because you sold out to Jesus. Did you know that you can commit to something but not be dedicated to it? You, you can dedicate or you, you can commit to something and not be dedicated to it. But when you're dedicated and when you're, when you're committed to it, nobody has to ask you to come. That's because you're sold out. We need to sell out. The house needs to sell out. The body of Christ needs to sell out. I know what I'm preaching is not really popular right now, but it's, it's the truth. And I'm going to keep preaching this in love because I love to preach in love and I love to see change take place because unless change takes place, we can't be the church. We'll just be like that rat going round and round and round and round, making it look good on the inside, but what's taking place on the outside? When you're sold out to Jesus, rainy weather won't keep you away. When you're sold out to Jesus, rainy weather won't keep you away. When you're sold out to Jesus, cloudy weather won't keep you away. Why? Because you ain't going to, you ain't going to please anybody in the house. This is our worship to God. This is our praise to God. Now, don't get me wrong. I love you being here, and I love gleaning from your gifts, and I pray that you enjoy using mine, but I don't come here for you. I come here to worship God. We enter to worship, and we depart to serve. Being sold out to Jesus, or, or when, you, when you're sold out to Jesus, leaving church early won't take place. Leaving church won't take place when you're sold out to Jesus. This doesn't, this doesn't include the people that's got work to go to. I'm not talking about that. That's, that's, that's a given. You got to go to work. You need to go to work on time, right? Um, sir, I, I, my pastor preached a little bit long today. That's why I'm 15 minutes late. Oh, well, it's okay. Just sign that pink slip. <laughs> and then you come back to me that next Sunday, Pastor, I got a pink slip because you preached a little bit too long. <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? I'm going to give you a tip. Next Sunday, when it's whatever time, and you, you need to leave in plenty of time to get to work on time, right? So this is what I want you, next Sunday, this is what you need to do. This is something we was taught in, in the old Baptist church. You remember for me with the, with the Baptist tip? <laughs> if y'all familiar with the, watch this, y'all. If you're familiar with the Baptist tip, put your hand up. If you ain't got a clue what I'm talking about, put your hand up. I'm glad our church is diverse. <laughs> Did y'all notice that all the black folks raised their little hand up? <laughs> so, in other words, let me give y'all a demonstration. If you got to go use the bathroom and the preacher's up preaching, you politely get up out of your seat. Now, you, you, you can't just walk. That's the Baptist walk. You don't do no Baptist walk. It's the Baptist tip. Tip right on up out of there. What you do when you come back? <laughs> Tip right on back to your seat. My whole point is, if you got to go to work, you go to work. You ain't got the tip. Just, just, we understand. I'll never call you out. But when you're in love with Jesus... If the pastor preaches uh, five or ten minutes over, what's the big deal? Never once have I said our church is over at 12 o'clock anyway. Never will I. And when God is still speaking, guess what I'm going to continue to do? When the Holy Spirit says, hush, guess what I'm going to do? As a whole and as a body, and as a local church, we should be farther than what we are. Angela, you, you need to tip on out of here. <laughs> 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 Amen. 
Amen. Just don't tip over, okay? <laughs> Jesus said, how long shall I have to put up with you? In other words, you should be farther along than what you are. House family, I will not challenge you again. I have challenged you before. You guys remember a couple, two or three years ago, I challenged you to come to 930 Bible study. And man, we had, I'm, I'm, I'm talking uh, prayer. And man, we had a nice cry out. But you notice after a while, it dwindled down and went back to where it normally was. Why is that? Don't be offended. Because it was a challenge. And it's got to come from the heart. See, when you're sold out to Jesus, don't get me wrong, we're, we, we get, I get lazy sometimes. We're not talking to perfect people. I get lazy sometimes. But when you sold out to Jesus, ain't nobody got to talk you into nothing. Ain't got to talk you into nothing. Nobody's got to talk me into studying my Bible. Nobody's got to talk me into praying. Nobody's got to talk me into being to church on time. I'm going to say it. If we could be to work every day, Monday through Friday on time, why can't we come to church on a Sunday morning once a week on time? I'm not going to challenge you. But I am going to tell you this. Just simply fall in love. Simply fall in love with Jesus. It makes me want to sing falling in love. I, I won't do it. It makes me want to sing falling in love with Jesus. It's the best thing I've ever done. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. Let me get ready to close. How do we get people to sell out to Jesus? How do we get people? How do I get you to fall in love with Jesus? How do we, how do you get people to fall in love with Jesus? You don't. You don't get people to fall in love with Jesus. They must do it themselves by falling in love with him. I can't do it. I can't cause you to fall in love with God. You've got to do it on your own, just like I had to do it on my own. I had to make some changes. I had to prioritize. You ain't the only one that came to church late before. I used to come to church late too as well until I fell in love with Jesus. Preacher, are you trying to tell me that I'm not in love with Jesus and I gave my heart to God? I'm talking about a different level. I'm talking about going beyond heart level where you surrender your life to God, where your time no longer becomes your time, but your time becomes God's time, where everything that you do is for the glory of Almighty God. It's where, it's where God becomes more important than your supervisor. God becomes more important than your supervisor. You want to please your supervisor because you might get written up, but you get there every week on time. But, oh, it's just church. You don't verbally say that, but that's our attitude, that's our mindset. It's just church. Is it really? Who gave you your job? How you get to work? Whose bed did you sleep in last night? My bed? No, God's bed. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. Pastor, you really, you, you're really doing it today. You're really stepping on my shoes. Let me miss your shoes and get your feet. Like I get mine too. Are you a sellout? Are you a sellout? If not, choose this day to sell out for Jesus. And then you'll see the church really become the church. Then you'll truly see revival take place. Then you'll see the manifestation of God take place like we've never seen him manifest before. Let's pray.
Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you, we bless you, we glorify your name. Lord, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, your name is to be praised. Father, help us to make the main thing the main thing. Lord, may we fall madly in love with you where everything that we do will be done for your glory. No matter what it is, it'll be done from the depths of our heart. Father, I ask that you would transform this church. I pray that you would just light a fire under every one of us, oh God. Create in us a hunger, oh God. A hunger and a thirst after righteousness. A hunger and a thirst, oh God, to become difference makers. A hunger and a thirst to lead the quest of making that which is wrong right. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to ask that nobody look around as I conclude.